one to Wake Med Soccer Park in Cary on the North Carolina Sports Network. It's our first episode of our North State Tailgate and Traveling Circus presented by the North Carolina Sport Council. I'm Chris Edwards. Great to be with David Glenn, Coach Jimmy Collins, and JR Equipment are here at Wake Med Soccer Park for the first ever football games played at this venue. DG, really excited about this new venture with the North Carolina Sports Network and excited to be here for a great day of football. I am great. I'm happy to see you, Chris. I'm glad you're a part of this new venture, JR and Coach as well. Uh, we'll get into the details of it as we celebrate these four high school football teams. We'll, of course, get into some college football a little bit later as well. But I'm just happy to be a part of the new North Carolina Sports Network. Uh, and this, it's a mouthful, but the old North State tailgate and traveling sports circus as well. Uh, Coach Jimmy Collins is here. Coach, thanks for being here. Excited to have your expertise uh, on the program. Well, I don't know about expertise, <laughs> but I'm excited to be here. Looking forward to it. It's my, actually my first year out of college coaching in a long long time so so i'm looking forward to it i've missed it but, but it gives me an opportunity to get back and get involved in the game and jr equipment is here giving us a player perspective jr great to be with you as well oh it's good to be here it's good it smells like football it feels like football i'm ready let's go uh, let's talk about this north carolina <laughs> sports network a little bit david uh, give us the, kind of the genesis behind the north carolina sports network launched on july the 6th and what we're doing out here with the North Carolina Sports Network. Yeah, well, I've been covering college sports and really all sports in North Carolina, believe it or not, it makes me feel old to say this, since 1987. And, and this is the fifth time that I've kind of looked at the landscape and said, I think there's a void out there. And I think that along with a lot of other talented people, I can help fill that void. So back in the 90s, I created the ACC Sports Journal magazine, and we covered things that the newspapers and other media just, I didn't think were doing as good a job of covering. End of the 90s, I created the, the ACCSports.com website. So just a variation of a theme. And then later, the syndicated statewide radio show and, and a different version of what we're doing here with the tailgate tour. And each time, I just saw a void in the marketplace. And everybody at this table, Coach and JR and, and you and I, have seen the watering down of media. Mm -hmm. And I mean media in the broader sense, right? You see layoffs at ESPN newspapers started their decline in the 1990s and more recently you know people are asking me why are all their favorite am fm sports radio hosts getting fired or retiring <laughs> well it's because their economic model is crumbling so if the newspaper coverage has gone down which we know it has and am fm sports radio coverage has gone down which we know it has and local tv coverage has gone down which we know it has well, I'm thinking maybe there's a void to fill there. And if you've been around for 35 years, you, you start accumulating really talented people and you look forward to working with them. So we created the North Carolina Sports Network. And as we look forward to the coaches' expertise with JC and the players' expertise with JR, uh, I'll just tell people quickly that the North Carolina Sports Network, to me, is really the only Swiss Army knife media platform right now. What do I mean by that? Well, we have a YouTube channel, the video element. We have a rebooted podcast of the David Glenn Show. So you have the audio element, not just my stuff, but other audio, not just my weekly uh, YouTube channel shows, but a lot of other video. But we also have 100,000 plus social media followers. And a lot of our new sponsors like that outreach because we all know social media is that important. Unlike a lot of people, we have our own website. Yep. So people can actually go to ncsportsnetwork.com, and it's as simple as if you like the YouTube channel, click the word watch. If you like DG's audio, click the word listen. If you like my old school articles on the website, you just click read, right? So we made it simple that way. And then, of course, this is part five. This, mm -hmm. is, this is one element of that Swiss Army knife where we're interactive. We are face-to-face -face with the sports fans of North Carolina. And sometimes we use the phrase from the, the beach to the mountains, like we're literally going to be in Riceville Beach next yep. week. <laughs> yep. And a few weeks after that, we'll literally be in Boone, North Carolina. So, I mean, we're living the, the mountains to the beach and everywhere you would want to stop and watch football or basketball in between. Uh, I don't know if there is another, seriously, I don't know if there's another sports media enterprise in this state that offers this video and audio and social media reach and website and this face-to-face -face interactive stuff with our new old north state tailgate and traveling sports circus i got it right again and i'm yes. proud of that uh and and you know i mean coach has coached forever yeah i hate to say this but i'm one of the oldest independent sports media members left who's now either dead or retired or, or fired 
So we're trying to put that unique expertise to work from a player's perspective with JR, coach's perspective with coach, uh, and my multimedia perspective. You obviously prepare teams in weather like this. From a coaching perspective, what's it like in these dog days of summer? From a college football perspective, you're still two weeks away right. from opening up your season against somebody else. What's it like this time of year trying to get your football team ready? Well, the key, of course, it's, it's obvious, is conditioning. Uh, you have to prepare your team to play in this kind of heat. We are in the South. I spent 12 years coaching at the University of Florida. We, during those days, we practiced at 9 in the morning and 4 in the afternoon. We were still in two-a-days, those things. But we were a really well-conditioned football team. Plus, plus, if you've done a good job with your off-season program and they came into training camp in great shape, then the conditioning part in training camp becomes a great deal easier than if you had not. And I'm talking about from a high school perspective when I make that comment. And then we can say all along that you still go into the same things. Let's take care of the ball. Let's execute on offense. Let's execute in the kicking game. And let's execute on defense. But I think conditioning is the key. With that thought in mind, obviously, since you've been around the game coaching, playing for a long time, how have you seen the offseason start to evolve? Well, from a, I, I haven't been in high school football in so long, but I've been in there and I've seen the programs and I've watched what they've done. But from a, from a college and pro perspective, the strength coach and the strength coaching staff, notice I said staff, mm -hmm. not just one, mm -hmm. they touch your players more than you do as a position coach. So that staff is as critical as anybody that you can, that you can hire as a head football coach. They, it's their job to prepare them so that when they come to practice, they're ready to be engaged. We had a, we had a great guy that used to be at North Carolina at the University of Florida. He was in the NFL by the name of Rich Tootin. Rich has his own podcast out there right now. But Rich Tootin, you knew when they when they walked on the on the practice field, they were ready to practice, and you knew they were ready to play in the game because he had them ready, mm -hmm. without a doubt. From a player perspective, Jr., how's it changed in your mind trying to get ready for a season to start with the conditioning? Uh, I don't know because because nowadays it seems like because I have a fourteen year old son and he's playing JV, they have there's more access to him in the summertime mm -hmm. to the off season program, so. They they've been working out all summer as a team together. We didn't we didn't have that you know, twenty years ago when I was in high school. So, so a guy like myself, you know, I'm three hundred plus pounds. So that with 20, 30 plus pads on top of that, and jerseys, pants, and everything is tough. But um, you just got to be mentally focused. You got to be mentally tough and focused on your job at hand, and knowing you're you're tired of hitting everybody else. You're tired of hitting your teammates at practice. Let's go hit somebody else for a little while. Yeah, how nice is it to see another color jersey across oh, the line? Oh, man. Oh, that's so good. Looking out from mouth water and looking at that other team. Much <laughs> <laughs> ready, much ready on High the High school side. football is still one of the last college recruiting aspects where you don't have to worry about the showcase or the travel ball. Mm -hmm. where, where what yeah. they do on the high school football field, the relationship with the high school football coach, it still matters to these colleges and these college coaches. It does matter a lot, and I'll give you an even sort of uh, broader perspective on that. When if you go back 100 years, and I know this is a crazy fact <laughs> to bring up, but the most popular sports in our country 100 years mm -hmm. ago were baseball, boxing, and horse racing, okay? So fast forward to when Coach Collins was born or later when I was born, football was starting to rise but was not yet the behemoth. Believe it or not, there are a lot of college conferences that made as much money in men's basketball 20 years ago. I'm not talking about the Stone Ages. Mm -hmm. 20 years ago, they made as much or more in men's basketball as they made in football. Fast forward all the way to 2023, when the professional pollsters just asked Americans, just not just sports fans, but like the, the Americans walking down the street, do you follow Sport X? And they just keep asking you. You're allowed to say more than one. There are only three sports where more than half of American adults say, yes, I follow those sports. They are baseball, a little more than 50 percent, basketball, a little more than 50 percent, and football is almost 80 yeah. percent. That is not a slight difference. And that has not been a, a flick of the switch. Like, you know, when you go to bed, that has been an evolution over maybe not 100 years, but a massive evolution even in my lifetime of more than 50 years. Wow. So we're seeing this high school jamboree that you're talking mm -hmm. about. 
We're on the verge of, in a couple of weeks, all of those made-for-TV intersectional college games. The NFL is literally the wealthiest sports organization in the history of the world. Like, that's not an exaggeration. <laughs> Even bigger than, you know, English Premier League soccer and, you know, Indian cricket and, and all the rest. <laughs> it's incredible how the sport of football has become this behemoth. And it's just, I'm excited to be a part of this. We saw the look on some players and cheerleaders' faces as they're going into this big game or pair of games at Wake Med Soccer Park. And it, to me, it just symbolizes this tidal wave of football love that we're all part of. This changed so much mm-hmm. through the years. It's not close to where it used to be. The, uh, the, the old recruiting calendar, there, there used to be a period that you – could get away from that recruiting part. Now recruiting is 365 days a year, 24-7. The high school coach is still a factor, but not as big a factor as it was at one time. There are so many outside agencies, and we we, we use the term sometimes called street agents that, <laughs> that are involved in this process now that, that it, it, it's changed a great, great deal. And seven-on-seven seven leagues, mm-hmm. kids going in involved in seven-on-sevens, the coaches that are, that are involved in there. And then the other big factor out there is you have kids that are going to see their own uh, a coach, a developmental coach outside of their coaching staff that are factors also, not to mention their parents yeah. at that point in time. <laughs> uh, J.R., what do you remember about your recruiting experience heading to NC State? Oh, wow. Wow, it was – man. I loved every single minute of it because um, my mom, she made like a scrapbook and kept like a lot of my letters and all that kind of stuff in there and newspaper clippings and everything. So I just, I remember just couldn't wait to get home every day after school to see what came in the mailbox and, you know, all the different from colleges all across the country and everything. And um, it was, it was a very humbling experience and just, just to realize that there are people out there, are college programs out across all the country wanting me to be a part of that program. It was, it was a fun experience. Nice to go to the mailbox and get good news and not bills, you know? Yeah. <laughs> well, it's funny. I'm trying to remember I'm trying to remember exactly how old JR is because... 44. Okay, so if I do that math in my head, I mean, I, we all know the world is different in 2023, oh. but I remember toward the end of the 90s, the internet had not, like, super exploded. Yep. Um, cell phones and smartphones had not yet super exploded. So you're like half old school with the way that you were. Physical uh, letters. He's full. Uh, cool. cool. he's, he's, he's full. Cool. Well, cool. <laughs> well, 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 let me so, ask you this question. Here's an interesting question. For, for many, many years, high school players and junior college players, et cetera, et cetera, were allowed five official visits. You yes. could go on five trips. Mm-hmm. Now it is unlimited. It wow, really just, the rule just changed. They can take as many wow. official visits as they want now. Plus, when you came through, official visits started in in the fall mm-hmm. and ran mm-hmm. through signing day, yep. which is the first Wednesday in uh, in February. February third. Now, now that. official visits are also in May and June, not only wow. in that winter time period, also. So the recruiting calendar has changed so, so much yeah. to go along with social media and everything that goes along with that. That's incredible. So you would think all the coastal colleges would have an influx of <laughs> players coming in, <laughs> recruitment at the beach. I wanted one of my visits to be Hawaii. The, <laughs> the University of Hawaii. I don't even Probably play not. your sport. Just invite me. If I'd have got a letter from Hawaii, I would have been like, hey, the big men are okay over there. You know? They're the normal. That's there. great. We've heard a lot about name, image, and likeness in college sports. How much have we seen name, image, and likeness trickle down to the high school level and in North Carolina specifically? Well, as of now, right now, North Carolina doesn't allow NIL in high school sports. And uh, and but but now I think there's 36 states that do. Um, so we were with my sons who both play college sports. They've seen it. Obviously, it's it's been very present in the last mm-hmm. couple of years. Um, we haven't seen it as much in North Carolina, but it's coming. I mean, it's 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 the it's the natural evolution of the business. Right. It's going to go. What happens in college is going to happen in high schools eventually. And uh, so it's coming. So I think we all got to be aware and present and, and knowledgeable. From your about perspective, it. how much has the transfer pool changed college football and college sports as a whole? Obviously, it's had a huge impact on what we're doing in, in, in college football right now. And it's uh, uh, you have a choice as a as as a head football coach and a staff. Whether you go, and I and I look at it this way: with my short time 
the pro ball, you, you really need to have a college personnel staff, which is your high school recruiters, and you need to have a pro personnel mm -hmm. staff, which, which equates to recruiting the transfer portal because you have to check the transfer portal every day. And the, the thing about the transfer portal, if you wait until a name shows on the portal, you're way behind. It's over. Uh, because most of the ones that are players already have in mind what they want to do before they go into the portal. That's why you see so many names that are in the portal that never get recruited. They get left in the portal and with, with nowhere to go. I think I saw something on Twitter or X or whatever we're calling it now earlier this week. In college basketball, I think 45% of the players that were in the portal are not going to play college basketball next year. It does not surprise me at all. Uh, and as I say, if you if you don't have a destination that's committed to you at some point, then you are at least some options out there. Then you you're you're probably you're probably better off staying where you are. From a coach's perspective, though, do you feel like you're having to recruit your players and your student athletes every single year now? Uh, it depends on where you are. Uh, if you're in Alabama and in Georgia and, and some of those places. Their competition is so great mm -hmm. that uh, you, they lose players, but at the same time, they re-sign players that, that, that fill in and fill those needs right away because competition every day at those places is, is unbelievable. Bring JR in here for, for this. From a player perspective, JR, the yeah. transfer portal, I just, just your <laughs> thoughts and how it's changed the game from, from how a player would, would view things. It's weird because I, I see it from both sides. I see, you know, I see the good and the bad in it as far as, you know, you don't want to give kids the the thought of, oh, you're not, if you're not happy where you are just because you're not, you know, playing ahead of somebody else, even though that person might even be better than you, if you're not happy in your situation that you can just quit and go. And, but also on the other side of that, if a person, you know, feels like they are wanting a better opportunity and everything, I don't, I don't see anything wrong with that, but but it does it does hurt the kid like like you were saying like if you don't have any place that wants you, it's not going to do you any good because you're just going to go to the same place and be in the same situation. One quick thing for Coach Collins before we let the transfer portal go, I've had a lot of basketball coaches tell me that whereas there are a lot of things about the transfer portal they do not like, under the previous rules to rebuild your program, let's say you were Clemson or somebody else way behind the heavyweights in eight in the ACC. DC. If you didn't have enough talent, you knew those high school freshmen you were signing were not as good as the high school freshmen mm. or, or college freshmen that Duke and Carolina were signing. One thing that the transfer portal has allowed is quicker turnarounds, right. at least yeah. in a sport yeah. that has 13 scholarship players. You don't you don't have to say, well, maybe in three years we'll be good with the way you often did in basketball. Now, obviously, football is like steering a monster compared <laughs> to 13 scholarship sport like men's basketball. But what do you think is the bottom line there? Well, I, I think what you're what you're saying is absolutely true. But at the same time, you look at Alabama; they signed the running back at uh, Jamar Gibbs at, at, at Georgia Tech last year to supplement what they're doing there. So I don't think it's any different than basketball, especially when you're recruiting at a high high level. There's gonna be there's gonna be times you miss on high school players, mm -hmm. and then you dip into the portal at that time to supplement your 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 recruiting out of the high schools. And you build your base back up. That's just like that's just like uh, unfortunately for North Carolina, they lost heavily in the secondary. Well, they went out and they went to the portal and they signed kids out of the portal. And those kids that, that 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 have come in will help them in the back the end. Portal now, and talking about the coaching staffs a little bit, guys. There's been some shifts to coaching staffs around our state in terms of who's on the staff, who's moving around. It's the attrition that we see every single summer heading into the fall. Yeah, we have most of the head coaches back, sure. but we have some pretty big changes at the coordinator position, including uh, really high-profile ones at NC State and UNC. I think those are the two. Really, there's three. If we wanted to dip outside of our state, 
for just a second. We had we had James Shipley mm-hmm. here. Uh, uh, Garrett Riley at Clemson yep. is obviously significant. He TCU, what he did with the quarterback at TCU last year, taking them taking them to the national championship game. Then you move into our, our state, and it's it's really significant at the University of North Carolina with Phil Longo moving on to Wisconsin and also uh, with the offensive line coach uh, going there with him. So there's two replacements there. Chip Lindsey has, has, a, has a great history of running offenses. He's been with Todd Munkin. He's been with Malzahn. So he's got a great background. He's been a head coach. Randy Clements comes in as the offensive line coach to that, and he has history with the Browse family. Uh, and then I think another significant guy that that is a volunteer at the University of North Carolina is Clyde Christensen. And Clyde Christensen has coached uh, some pretty good NFL quarterbacks named Brady and Peyton Manning. <laughs> oh, yeah, I've heard of them. Uh, so he may, he may bring a little something to the table for those guys. And then I'll be quick here. And I think the addition of Rod and I at North Carolina State with Brennan Armstrong will be significant. Having coached and played against them, uh, Robert and I is very creative. Native, and the best years that Brennan Armstrong had in this league were under his guidance. Yeah, Brennan mm-hmm. Armstrong, who had a great career at Virginia, poised to do more great things in the ACC. DG. For sure. And the Brennan Armstrong of two years ago yeah. in Charlottesville was really good when Robert and I was with him. The Brennan Armstrong without Robert and I last year was not very good in Charlottesville. So obviously this reunion is a huge part of Dave Doran's optimist, optimism uh, at NC State. Go, real Pat. quick follow up, real quick follow up, <laughs> Coach Collins. From the outside, and I spent some time in Chapel Hill. From the outside, it looks really, really strange that when you have a famous quarterback named Drake May returning, that the offensive coordinator would depart. That just mm. there's, you know, Arsenio Hall used to say on his late night show, some things make you say, hmm. <laughs> Like that makes me say, hmm, you think coaches would be dying to stay when you have a proven quarterback going into potentially another productive year that makes the coordinator look good. Well, I I think one thing that that, uh, is, is out there that, that, Unless you're unless you're within that structure and know those people, Phil Longo's wife is from Wisconsin, and, and Ed gave her the opportunity with with the kids and all to be back close to home. Now, you know whether whether there were discussions between Coach Brown and Coach Longo and those things. You know, we always always wanted to run the football better. Maybe those discussions there i was not i was not privy to those discussions so it, it did happen quick we did struggle to run the football a little bit at the end of the year so we'll see where it all goes turn our focus now to week one of the college football season which is coming up in just a couple of weeks and there's a question marks i'm sure for everybody as we head into week one of the college football a lot of unknowns jr we'll start with you give us maybe one question mark that you're looking for as we head into week one of the college football season does is is this going to be our year at NC State? <laughs> you know, I mean, every year we wish it. We always have good defense. We always You're not a homer, people, are you, JR? <laughs> I'm a little bit of a homer. I, I am. I am. We always put people in the NFL, but we it, it's weird we don't get championships. It doesn't cross over to big bowl games or championships. I, is this going to be the year? And is Doran on the hot seat, if not? Let me ask you this, though, JR. Think about the history of this area. Yeah, who's who is the last team in this area to win a conference championship mm. in the state of North Carolina? It was Wake Forest, Wake, right? Wake it Forest. was Wake Forest. It was. It's wow. been since it's been. I don't know when. But it's 1980 for the for North it's Carolina. It's been 1979 for NC State and 1980 for wow. UNC. Yeah. That's the last ACC football title. And I, I, I'm mm. going to correct you here for a second, okay? I was on a staff at 1989 at, at, at Duke when we, when we. Oh no, I didn't say anything of Duke. Duke's, Duke was 89. I just, I just talked yeah. with Coach Spurrier. Yeah. I remember that. One. I covered that one. I, I was still in college, but I, I covered, there. I covered Duke's. Uh, back then, they didn't even have a title game, That's so right. it was co-champions wow. between yep. Virginia. It was co-champions. And Duke. We actually lost to Virginia big at Virginia, and yep. ended up being co-champions. 
Coach, for you yeah. as we get ahead, look ahead toward week one, what are your biggest question marks? Well, I, I think I don't have this question mark, but I think a lot of people out there are going to question the improvement of the North Carolina defense. Mm. Uh, I happen to think, and I was in the room, and and, and I think Cedric Gray and Thor Eccles and those guys are, are, are great leaders on their defense. They've got a lot of good players up, and up back, back up front. I think they helped themselves in the back end. They're in the second year of Gene Six. Uh, pack, so I'd be much improved, but to a lot of people, there's a question. DG, Chris, I don't, I don't give short answers very it's often. Okay. <laughs> I don't know if I can stick to one, but look at it this way: my one at the NFL level, since we're celebrating yeah. football at all levels right now. Uh, the Carolina Panthers have both a new head coach in Frank Reich and a new quarterback in mm. number one overall, Bryce Young. I mean, that's something to watch right here in our backyard. At the college level. At Carolina, I mean, now as Sam Howell has just recently announced the starting quarterback for the mm -hmm. Washington Commodores, UNC has not sent a large number of quarterbacks to the next level. They've actually done it a little bit recently with Mitch Trubisky and Sam Howell and soon, obviously, Drake May. Mm -hmm. But the Heels have not really cashed in with those 10 or more win seasons when they have those special quarterbacks. They've had good teams, right. but Drake May might be the best NFL quarterback prospect ever produced by the University of Carolina in, you know, like 100 wow. years. Yeah. Wow. And they got to cash in on that. Um, and NC State does have another good team, uh, and they need Brendan Armstrong to deliver. But I'm watching all over the place, man, because East Carolina has a really good mm -hmm. head coach in Mike Houston. And remember the. The schools in the American Athletic Conference that have been winning, not all, but the majority of the AAC football title, aren't there. That's right. You know, Houston, Central Florida, and Cincinnati won five of the eight AAC title games. That game's only been around for so long. Well, guess what? They're all Big 12 now. So on the cracked door opportunity for me, for a Pirate Nation that hasn't had a conference event since the 1990s. Uh, much like Coach Collins examined the ACC a little bit earlier. App State has played in three of the five Sun Belt football title games, mm. but they were not great last year. So will Sean Clark bring the Mountaineers back? And it's a long list, and it makes it fun. Whether you're a yeah. fan of high school football, college football, or pro football, we have no shortage of great headlines this year. And, gonna and don't forget it. About the guy in Durham, guy by under center also. Uh, he is a he oh, is a, yeah, yeah, wow. he is a heck of a player. I tell you, we we played them on in a in a night game over there, and we, we when I was at North Carolina, we were so fortunate to get out of here, out of there that night. He played. circus DG. We're going to be as you mentioned earlier, all across the state. Wrightsville Beach next week. We'll be uh, down in Charlotte in a couple of weeks for the season opener, North Carolina against South Carolina all over the state with some of the biggest college football games that are going on in our state. And, you know, it's crazy. Mike Waddell is putting us to work. Yes. You know, it's, <laughs> it's to benefit the, the sports fans of North Carolina. But, for example, I've done another version of the tailgate tour. I can promise you I never did two games in a single weekend. That's right. <laughs> so, for example, when South Carolina plays North Carolina, and, I mean, that's a biggie, right? It's mm -hmm. in Charlotte. Both of those fan bases will be well represented. You got Drake May of Carolina. You got a Hall of Fame coach in Mac Brown. The Tar Heels have a lot at stake. The Gamecocks have a lot at stake. We'll have a lot of fun there. Uh, but then two days later, we're gonna we're gonna be in Durham as a Duke team that won nine games last year hosts a Clemson team that has won seven of the last eight ACC titles, and both have young quarterbacks that they're excited about. So. We're going to be where the big games are. Mm -hmm. Also, within the next month, we're at the Aggie Eagle Classic, which is something I've gotten to know pretty well over these last 20 years. It's it's NC Central against North Carolina A&T. This year it happens to be at A&T, so we'll be in Greensboro. I've been at the Durham version many times as well. But you're talking about you know the two most prominent HBCUs yep. in our state to play football and two of the best in the country. I mean, Central yeah. won the yeah. HBCU national title yeah. last year. Sure did. So we're going to hit – a lot of great cities and a lot of great games. And hopefully, you know, we'll share the passion of our viewers and listeners and share the expertise that, that all four of us have in different ways. Yeah, and then coming up in the middle of September, we'll be in Boone for the big in-state matchup, yeah. East Carolina against App State. That'll be a lot of fun there, too. Yeah, th that those two don't get together a whole they lot, don't. right? <laughs> it's, it's the prominent program in the easternmost part of our state against the prominent football program in the westernmost part of our state. They've never been in the same league, right? So you... You kind of go out, have to go out of your way to schedule each other. They did play a few years ago, um, and, and both you know both schools have high expectations. But to get where they want to go, they got to go through the that 
team on the other sidelines. And we all know that everybody's optimistic about their ultimate win total in the month of August. Uh, for, for JR and for Coach, how excited are you guys to be part of this and being out across the state, seeing some of the best college football that our state has to offer? Go ahead, JR. Oh, I'm very excited. I'm, uh, I've always wanted to be a part of some kind of some kind of coverage or some team covering the whole state of North Carolina. But we have so much to offer from the mountains to the Piedmont to the coast. Why not highlight it all? Again, I, I echo exactly what JR is saying. It's it's exciting for me to have the opportunity to go to some games. I, I didn't I didn't think at all the day I decided that I was not going to go back to, to North Carolina. I didn't think I wanted to go to another football game. Mm -hmm. I've done 40, 40 some years of doing this, working every Saturday yeah, and all those sure. things. Sure. But I am absolutely excited to be part of this process. And I appreciate all you guys allowing me to be part of this process. And we appreciate our friends of the North Carolina Port Council. No matter who your favorite team is, we can all agree that North Carolina is the barbecue capital of the world. The North Carolina Port Council is proud to represent thousands of family farmers who responsibly produce the barbecue, bacon, and other pork products that are so well loved across North Carolina and around the world. Learn more at ncpork.org, the North Carolina Port Council, the foundational partner for the North Carolina Sports Network. Stay with us. A couple of special guests are coming up on the other side of this break. You're watching and listening to the Old North State Tailgate and Traveling Sports Circus on the North Carolina Sports Network.